I adore clothes, love shopping, and cover fashion for the BBC's Iranian audience. Whether we like it or not, we live in a fast fashion era. The see now, buy now, wear now mentality has become a normal part of the modern consumer behavior. Some of the fast fashion companies, they have close to 52 collections a year, so every week there's something new in the store, and that's to get people to come in. High street brands have accelerated this cycle, enabling shoppers to get their hands on the latest fashion trends soon after they appear on the catwalks. But this consumerism, driven especially in the West, is having a devastating impact on our planet. Conventional fabrics, they are quite polluting. They use a lot of water, they use a lot of fertile soil, they use pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, that has a big environmental impact. Often we wear our clothes just a few times before throwing them away meaning millions of garments are dumped in landfill. That onesie fleecy fabric is, is my pet hate, because we can do virtually nothing with it. But does it have to be this way? I'm going on a year-long journey to meet the farmers, inventors and designers at the cutting edge of going green. We want to help a farmer be able to tell how much of the plants, the seeds that he planted in the ground have actually come out. If we can actually count to the individual plant how many plants are in the field. What about this one? What is it made of? So this one is fish from the pineapple leaf fiber. This is from repurposed tires basically. So it's made from apple peels. I'm meeting the people in the fashion industry around the globe who are helping us to turn the tide against waste. Brands, designers and students and also the customers are starting to really understand the implications of their decisions and people are changing. Last year alone, it's estimated up to $3 trillion was spent on fashion. And there are few better places to shop for your latest outfit than here in London's trendy West End. Sustainable fashion, also called eco-fashion, is part of the growing design trend. The goal is to create a system which can be supported indefinitely in terms of our impact on the planet. We are witnessing the first time ever that human beings are changing nature. We're changing the conditions of life because we're using up natural resources in ways that are not replenishable. We have become so overstimulated to buy new things all the time, particularly in the West, that we now own way more clothes than we really need. Many shoppers have a buy-now, throw-away-tomorrow attitude. Some are inspired by the top-end catwalk collections. We can quickly own the cut-price fast fashion version via shops on the high street and the internet. Here at London Fashion Week, they are showcasing the rising designers in the industry. Organizers are also keen to showcase a green message. The theme at London Fashion Week is Switch to Green. It's an initiative to push people to be more aware and more concerned about the impact of fashion industry on the environment. Good morning, 
I'm Caroline Rush and I'm Chief Executive of the British Fashion Council. Um, so, uh, on behalf of the British fashion industry, welcome to the 66th edition of London Fashion Week. How can we follow the latest fashion trends but buy fewer items? This consumer demand is a dichotomy of our industry and so addressing impacts and really looking at sustainable practices, looking about sourcing, supply chain and really looking at those challenges is really where business is focusing. When we think about the future of our planet, of our industry, is that you have to look to the younger generation and arming them with the tools and the opportunity to build sustainable businesses. I've been privileged to get behind the scenes access to the shows. I've found many smaller brands are leading the way in sustainability. Some designers want us to purchase quality pieces, although at a much higher price. How would you define your style? Um, quite crafted, but quite modern at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, girly, but tomboyish too. Yeah. Sadie Williams is one of the rising stars on the London fashion scene. She's a big proponent of upcycling, transforming items using waste materials to make a new piece. What do you do for a more sustainable fashion? Lots of the patches used on things, they'll be from an off-cut and then instead of chucking them away, we'll turn them into something decorative and, you know, upcycle another with them. So that's something that I like to do a lot, or reusing fabrics and then dyeing them for their next season. Do you think that a sustainable fashion is more for the rich people? No, not at all. I think there's choices that anyone can make at any um, level, really. The Adeline Lee show is going to start and um, I went to the back station. It looks really amazing. The models are preparing, so can't wait to see that. She uses very minimalistic lines, but at the same time very sophisticated and feminine. Sustainability might be all the rage at London Fashion Week, but for the average high street shopper, it's all about getting the latest fashion at the lowest possible price. Is it really possible to be fashion conscious and green? Some well-dressed fashionistas seem to think so. Do you think about sustainability when you buy your clothes? I think definitely. Um, I go for um, something I can always rewear and you reuse, and then that also saves money. Me too. I believe in the process of recycling always. So you won't change like with the trend. You would keep the same outfit, but then match it with the current trend. Yeah. Trends always keep very coming modern back. trend. Yeah. yeah. So trends always repeat itself. So yeah. this season it might be on trend, and then give it two years, and it's, it's back. back. Or if you call that main line and just go through until you get through to someone who's working at London Fashion Week Festival. I mean, she looks, she looks beautiful. After the show, the next day, I caught up with the tired and happy designer in person at her London house come studio. So we've been working really hard for the collection. We pulled it off and then all the aftermath afterwards. And then we had a party last night. All of us are in a little bit rough shape. <laughs> so these are three-dimensional flower shapes. Edilyn says she works hard to limit her brand's impact on the environment. I think what we can do is help to re-educate our audience um, about the value of good quality and what it means to buy into someone's design work, that it's an expression of creativity, that it's a valuable thing, um, not something that you buy in one day for a party and throw away the next day. And you don't need hundreds of clothes in your closet, you just need a few very well-made things. 
But at the moment, it's a challenge for designers, even if they want to be greener. And they claim it's all down to economies of scale. How important it is for you to use materials that are sustainable? I have tried in the past um, doing it a few times. Um, it's difficult because the fashion cycle moves very quickly, um, because we have deadlines that we have to keep to very quickly. The industry is not geared up first for designers like me who are making small collections. It's quite easy to do if you're buying thousands of meters of t-shirt cotton, but not that easy to do if you need tens of meters of a beautiful dress fabric. So it's complicated. Still, the industry still has to catch up. I want to see for myself where our clothes come from and how the manufacturing process is all put together. Leaving London behind, I'm going right back to the beginning and heading down to the farm. America is one of the largest exporters of cotton in the world. The first cotton seed was planted in American soil as early as the 16th century. Today, over 400 years later, the United States cotton industry is worth over three billion dollars. More than half is harvested for clothing. It's the most popular of natural fibers. But it uses a lot of water and can cause pollution through the use of chemicals in fertilizers and pesticides. Back in January, I wanted to see how cotton was grown. The first stop on my journey was the cold and snowy Mississippi. And sometimes you can have a real good harvest and then hurricanes come, rain fall, oh, okay. you, have a, you can have a disaster. Third generation farmer, Coley Bailey, wants to do the best for his children, his business and the planet. I feel like it's better today than it was when my father's father started farming. For me, I feel like it was better for him than it was when my grandfather started farming. And I know it's better today for my son and in 10 years down the road when, he, when he's here so I can have a fourth generation and a sixth generation farmer sitting right here beside us one day. New production techniques means he uses less water, fewer fertilizers, and the farm is generally more efficient. I think sustainability starts right here at the farm with myself, trying to do things that are helpful to the environment, that are more sustainable. It also means Coley can charge a premium for his crop. Sustainability has really gotten a good push, I'm going to say in the last 15 years. I've just got four employees. We are very efficient and uh, we're making better yields now than we've ever made. And uh, at the same time, we're making fewer trips across the field, burning less diesel fuel, there's less carbon going in the air. We're learning more about sustainability every day. He's proud of helping the environment while at the same time making a quality product for consumers. One thing that I can do is provide a product that somebody is willing to buy and has a peace of mind knowing that, it's, uh, that it was grown responsibly and safe. This whole area is cotton country and lots of livelihoods depend on the success of the crop. Just across the state line lies Black Oak, home to under 300 people. The main employer is the cotton processing plant, or Gene. 
The seeds separated out from the cotton, which is what the ginning process is all about. Mm -hmm. uh, Farmers are criticized for using pesticides, but here they argue they need them to kill aggressive weeds. It wouldn't be feasible for our growers to grow organic cotton because of the really resistant weeds. And we have some serious noxious weeds. Uh, one of the main ones we call the pigweed here. It has taken over the south, basically. So we have to use herbicides, and we have to use herbicide-resistant seed. We only spray when we have to, because the farmer doesn't want to spend money if he doesn't have to. The gene is owned by around 20 farmers. They've been working for decades to improve their efficiency. Cheryl's got them to sign up for the largest cotton sustainability program in the world. Better Cotton Initiative's purpose is to make cotton better for the people who grow it, better for the environment it grows in. It was started as an organization in 2010, began working in cotton producing countries in like China, Pakistan, India, and has since expanded to include 24 countries around the world. During the season, we have to do, we have to visit 10% of the farms and conduct verifications. Last year, the initiative supplied 14% of the world's cotton production. It aims to hold farms and businesses to account, so helping the environment. Companies are, are now responsible for their whole supply chain. If something happens, in a remote factory in Bangladesh, it's not legitimate for them to say, well, that's just a contractor, we have no control over that. That reflects negatively on their brand. Likewise with farms increasingly. If something happens untoward on a farm in their supply chain, by virtue of, of growing expectations, they're responsible for that as well. New advances in technology mean the cotton business may soon have some extra help to become even more efficient and green. This is awesome. <laughs> this is where we always uh, smile from the camera. Engineer Bobby Vick has been developing drone technology to help cotton farmers identify problem areas in their fields. The drone's camera has a visual sensor that measures the greenness of the crop. Red and white areas are where the crop is not thriving or non-existent. The farmers, are they receptive to such technology? Absolutely. Early on in the season, we want to help a farmer be able to tell how much of the plants, the seeds that he planted in the ground have actually come out. For certain crops, we can actually count to the individual plant how many plants are in the field. And then from that, we can inform the farmer about how much fertilizer they need to put on the field or where they need to target apply different herbicides or pesticides. So it's, it's really about more efficiently managing their field so that they can maximize the return on those products that they're putting in when, when it comes time for harvest. Much of the cotton from America ends up here, Turkey. It's a major importer of U.S. raw cotton. Turkey's fashion industry is worth over $17 billion in exports alone. It's a center for the supply and manufacture of textile and garments to the major high street retailers. I'm here to find out how they incorporate sustainability into the heart of their fashion industry.
I've come to see for myself what happens to raw materials like cotton in the next stage of the production process. Some products are dyed. Most manufacturers say it's not possible to use natural dyes on a huge scale. So synthetic dyes are used for cost, vibrancy and reliability. But synthetic dyes can use a lot of water and also cause terrible pollution. I'm on my way to Bursa, just south of Istanbul. I'm keen to see how some businesses are reducing the environmental impact of the dyeing process. We are always uh, working in order to reduce the dye cycle times. We can just control all the dyeing machines uh, with the central uh, control unit. And by using this system, we are trying to make a color match first time. This could also help us to use less uh, energy and uh, chemical uh, at the end. Bursa is famous for its textile industry. Many firms say they've been producing clothes in an ethical way long before it was on trend. We are trying to reduce our water consumption. We are trying to use the recycled water in the dyeing process and not to use the fresh uh, water in order to reduce the uh, waste at the end. The next stage in the chain is to turn the dyed threads into fabric. This family-owned company takes its social responsibilities and environmental commitments very seriously. Baran Kehan is the current manager of Soktash. They've been manufacturing cotton fabrics for nearly 50 years and supply major high street brands throughout Europe. To go from twisted cotton thread to a patterned fabric takes a number of processes and human oversight. This is the inspection table. Here we inspect every single fabric that comes out, every single meter that comes out of the factory. No matter how technological the machinery is, you always need a human touch. Human eye can catch everything better than a machine can. So there's a problem in the knotting, he says. If you want to come take a look where he's pointing, maybe you can see. Oh, it's very tiny, yeah. Yeah, when you have a trained eye, you can see it immediately. We yeah, can't. Yeah. These guys are experts. They can see things from a mile away almost. They pick out the little bits and fix it, little bit tweezers, and it's good as new. It's magic. It's gone. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> To make money, fast fashion stores need to shift a vast amount of clothes as the margins are so small. Profits and ethics don't always go hand in hand. At any given time, a fast fashion company might work with hundreds of suppliers, so I don't know how easy it is to control the whole supply chain. So as a supplier, as a small supplier, when you get that price pressure, you still want to keep the business. You might turn to some uh, more inexpensive options, which not, might not be as uh, sustainable as what you used before. Over the last decade, Baron says they've reduced water usage by a third and their energy bill by a quarter. Every saving helps conserve precious resources, but also helps the price. But even if cost isn't an issue, we need to think about the impact on the planet. 
So next on my journey, I'm going to a real fashion hotspot, New York. I'm hearing that a small revolution is happening here with some fashion retailers trying to change the way consumers buy their clothes. At the forefront is high-end designer Tara St. James. Now we're in a phase where we really see almost 12 collections a year from some brands. Every month they're coming out. Um, and then if you look at some of the fast fashion companies, they have close to 52 collections a year. So every week there's something new in the store. And that's to get people to come in. The time that I really love is this twist dress. Mm -hmm. so cotton. From I want to do the opposite of that. And I want to offer really well-made clothing that will last a long time and won't be too trendy. used to do that. Until quite recently, many people just had a few good items in their wardrobe. A winter coat, a party dress, a work suit, which would be worn from year to year. The way consumers saw clothes 40 years ago was very different from the way we see it now. People would buy things, they'd keep them for a lot longer, and the clothes were made in a way that they could be kept for a lot longer. For example, if you go vintage shopping, some of the clothing that you find from the 70s and 80s are still in perfect condition today. The same can't be said for fast fashion clothing that's now found in secondhand stores. They fall apart a lot more quickly. They're designed and produced that way so that the consumer won't keep it as long and will move on to buy something different. More than 15 million tons of used textile waste is generated each year in the USA. And that figure has doubled over the last 20 years. The landfills are starting to become overwhelmed with apparel. So you can imagine how huge that impact is on the environment and on the world. Tara thinks many shoppers are becoming aware of the issues. People want to be making better choices. I am very hopeful about the future. I think that the new generation of consumers really wants to have a connection with the brands that they're supporting with their dollars. And they want to understand how their products are made. They want to buy more thoughtfully and they want to make better decisions. And that's really exciting to see. Sarah buys into the philosophy that clothes should be valued and kept for a long time. This one is one of my favorite pieces and you can see these are all handmade and I just love it. When I go and buy stuff, I actually look on the inside and I like to see that hand sewn and completely irregular. You know, it looks like you did this at home. She buys clothes from markets in her home country, Iran, and uses the second-hand clothes to make unique garments with her own particular style, the very opposite of fast fashion. What do you think of fast fashion, where, you know, you, you buy and you wear it once and you throw it away? Why, what do you think of that? That's one of the things that I really, really don't like doing. I don't throw things away because they have a rip, I usually try to add some kind of a embellishment to it or fix it or at least make an effort to fix it. A 
and from recycling on a small scale to recycling on a massive scale back here in the UK. Batley in Yorkshire, England, famous as far back as the 19th century for the recycling of wool, rags and clothes into new blankets and carpets. I've come to the largest textile recycling plant in the UK, run by a charity. They have pioneered the reuse of textile so that none go to landfill. As a whole in the UK, the average lifetime of a garment of clothing is estimated at just 2.2 years. Extending that by just nine months can significantly reduce its environmental impact. Lorraine Needham Reed works for Oxfam. She's been on a mission to get us all recycling. I have trained sorters here that know what the premium brands are, what's on trend, etc. And they will sort and look for those brands and then they go to be sold on the Oxfam online shop. And what do you do with the low quality or damaged item? Some of the bad quality clothes get made into the little bit. The stuffing that goes between the springs at the top of your mattress and your bum, basically. So some of it gets re retaken back, would be the best description, and made into like a wadding. Lorraine and her colleagues try to salvage most materials, but there is one particular product that defeats them all. That onesie fleecy fabric is, is my pet hate, because we can do virtually nothing with it. And then the others are certain types of polyester. There is quite a bit of research going on at the moment to turn that back from um, a fabric back into chemicals so it can be respun but we're just on the edge of that, we aren't there yet. This operation doesn't just help the environment, it helps the charity too. You earn about a million pound a year. It's a substantial amount to overcome poverty and suffering, which is what our main aim is. If it wasn't profitable, we wouldn't have it, but it manages to do two things. It manages to be environmentally good and also raise a million pounds to go back into Oxfam's coffers. Lorraine thinks the issue of clothes recycling has started to resonate with shops and consumers too. Have you seen an increase in public awareness about sustainability? I think we're getting there. We've definitely, definitely seen an increase in the Textile Association members who want, you know, looking at a different way of doing things with cloth. We've definitely seen high street retailers looking at more sustainable fashion. And I think it's beginning now to come down into the public looking at it. And I think over the next few years, we'll see a, quite a sea change. I'm stunned by the scale of the unwanted and discarded clothes stacked up here. And it's not just happening here, but all around the globe. Just imagine the massive amount of waste we are all generating each year. Here at the London College of Fashion, young designers are learning how to manage the Earth's finite resources. And the idea of design for sustainability now goes way beyond a product. You're thinking about everything that goes before the idea of the concept, so thinking about the whole process of where things come from and then thinking about something through its whole life cycle as well. Professor Dillis Williams is teaching the designers of the future about sustainability. We're valuing most of our fashion far less than we used to. A lot of it only gets worn for a very short amount of time, it gets discarded. So good design has to be about finding ways in which the value of that piece can be extended. She wants to educate her students so they can change the industry from within 
it'd be probably far neater and easier for me to be able to say design for sustainability is these five things it's to do a b and c and, and off you go but it isn't Dillis believes the whole idea of fast fashion is a misnomer. She's trying to change the way her students and their customers think about clothes. Do you think that fast fashion is inherently unsustainable? The idea of fast fashion, I think, is a, a little bit of a problem. In fact, uh, no fashion is fast, whether it's uh, cultivation of a natural fiber, whether it's oil production, these, these materials take huge amount of time to create. With, with uh, fossil fuel production, hundreds of thousands of, of years to be able to create the oil that comes through the ground. So the idea of fast fashion really is only talking about one element of fashion. When we're talking about fast, we're talking about the fact that this very long time scale has then been sped up for one particular part, which is the use phase. People are buying and discarding things very quickly. But there's a lot long after effect as well. So actually, no fashion is fast, but the idea that we only enjoy something for a very short of time is inherently unsustainable. Students from the college were recently challenged to design a new women's collection using only second-hand clothes. The materials came from a garment collection scheme run in their shops by H&M. Can you show me the garment you made? What I did was combining all these pieces and making a new jumper, making something fashionable, trendy and completely zero waste. Serena Gaffrey was one of the winners. The competition stretched his creativity as a young designer. I felt restrictive. As a designer, I want to think about new ideas and I'd like to go bold with it. But um, with sustainability concept, you are restricted to some certain fabrics, colors and textures. But you know, the design process is also about finding solutions. The collection was displayed across H&M's London stores. I learned how to be creative with limited resources that I had. And I learned how to be conscious about uh, to make a garment, how, thinking about my patterns, the layouts, the colors. Also, I realized that sustainability expands beyond that. It's from material, community development, transportation. There are so many elements that as a designer I had to be aware of. Designers like Serena are also being encouraged to explore the potential of totally new materials being created through science and technology. This is the Future Fabrics Expo. Over a thousand designers, retailers and buyers are eager to sample the surprising and varied sustainable fabrics on show here. Nina, can you tell me more about this here? So this is our innovation section where we showcase biomaterials. We've got anything from the wine industry, which is a byproduct from the winemaking processes. We've got uh, photosynthesizing uh, fabrics, producing oxygen absorbing carbon dioxide uh, based on algae. Anything that is the future of textiles. This is very popular, so it is so soft. It is actually it's a mushroom. Really soft. So again, all of this is about showing what different materials there are. And of course, you'd have to probably line this with something to make it stronger. This um, is mushroom? Yeah, it's from a mushroom. Then we've got biodegradable sequins made of corn starch, which are actually disintegrating after wearing it two or three times. And the garment which then has another life once the sequins have dissolved. We've got exciting leather alternatives made from apple peel waste. We've got textiles made from uh, orange peels from the food industry. There's really so many different ones that we have here. 
the cost can be prohibitive and most are not quite ready to go mass market. But many are loving the new materials. Among the many designers are two young women from France. We are here to source uh, fake leather such as Apple Leather, and we really want to use an alternative to prove that you can launch a vegan brand even if it's not like real leather. And today we found very interesting, innovative new fabrics that can um, match our needs. Match our needs, yes. A lot of the fibres and the fabrics that we're using today, the conventional fabrics, they are quite polluting. They use a lot of water, they use a lot of fertile soil, they use pesticides, synthetic fertilisers that has a big environmental impact. And the things that you see around here all have a much lower environmental impact using green chemistry, not using hazardous chemicals. And do you think the designers, the retailers, and even the customers, they are receptive to this kind of fabrics? Absolutely. And every year that we show these fabrics to the fashion industry, we can sense how excited they are and how inspired they get. Do you think the fast fashion industry is moving towards a more sustainable use of fabrics? I would say there's a lot of very positive signs. We have a lot of retailers and very big fast fashion companies who attend the Future Fabrics Expo every year. And gradually over the years, they really come here to source such materials. Um, so it's really been evolving in absolutely the right direction. So, as a follower of fashion, but concerned about my impact on the planet, what have I learned? Well, by making small changes to our habit, we can all make a difference. So I'm going to keep my clothes for longer, wear them more often, and anything I don't need, I'll donate to charity. When I run my ideas past shoppers in Oxford Street, it reveals we've still got a way to go. When I'm shopping, I don't really think about the environment or the planet, I'm afraid. So I'm going to try and buy better quality products that are going to last me a lot longer. I would give them to like Goodwill or charity, something like that. Or I have younger siblings, so if it fits them, they like it, they have it. <laughs> if I want it or the girls need it, then we go and get it. It's it's just how it is, unfortunately. I don't give it much more thought than that. I've got a very conscientious daughter who likes to go and do the thrift shopping at the retro shops and stuff like that, so I've become more aware and more conscious of it. A mixed result, but overall, it's encouraging. I think it starts with each one of us. None of us need to wait for somebody else to take action. I think as designers, we have a particular role, a responsibility, but also an amazing opportunity for change. And people are changing. The culture of overconsumption is changing. <laughs>